Well, I want to take just a minute. Uh, this is Teresa Mayer. I'm the Vice President for Research and Partnerships here at Purdue. And um, I want to just take a minute and thank all of you uh, for attending our second virtual Discovery Park um, lecture series. And uh, I think for uh, many of you who have participated in the past, I uh, would like to take a moment and just um, recognize the uh, various sponsors for the support of the Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, first, the overall lecture series um, is being made possible by a generous gift from the Lilly Endowment. Um, this was actually established at the outset of Discovery Park, um, and it's a mechanism to engage the entire campus um, in bringing the latest thinking about hot topics in science and technology that are of broad public interest uh, to campus and beyond. And we were just talking a moment ago about the fact that our new virtual um, format is allowing uh, many more participants from uh, in, both inside and outside of Purdue. I'd also like to thank a couple of other organizations that have been instrumental um, both to the support as well as the planning of this distinguished lecture. Uh, the Center for the Environment, again, for both the support as well as the planning. So um, Tim, thank you very much for uh, your active engagement. Uh, the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources lecture series. So this is integrated with a number of other organizations on campus. And finally, the Susan Buckley Butler Center for Leadership Excellence. So once again, um, thanks to all of the organizations uh, for their support of this lecture. I just want to remind all of you um, that you will um, be muted throughout uh, so that um, we don't have any uh, interruptions during the presentation, but uh, we ask that you use the chat function for submitting your questions and you can submit your questions throughout the lecture. Um, we will collect those questions um, and then uh, Tim will be uh, hosting the Q&A session um, by reading the questions uh, to our speaker today. So once again, um, please uh, feel free to use the chat and we will be monitoring the chat. Um, so with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished lecturer this afternoon, um, Professor Diana Wall. And uh, I, we, I just learned um, that Professor Wall was here at Purdue not that long ago in 2014, um, also delivering a distinguished lecture. And so it's quite possible that many of you know her um, she is a world-renowned ecologist and the inaugural director of the School of Global Environmental Sustainability at Colorado State University. Um, her work over the years has, has emphasized the importance of biodiversity for ecosystem health and underlies the consequences of human activities on so soils on a global level. Uh, Wall's more than 25 years of research in the Antarctic continues to clarify the critical links between climate change and soil biodiversity. Her support of young scholars and dedication to working with others has also led her to many leadership positions, including the presidencies of the Ecological Society of America and the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Um, she's received a number of awards, including the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achieving in 2013. Uh, she's been inducted into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame in 2014. And this is a really fun fact. Uh, Wall Valley was named in recognition of her for her extensive research on soil biology in the McMurado Dry Valleys of Antarctica. Um, and that, that, is, that is such an interesting fact. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Wall now. Her, her talk is entitled Global Soil Biodiversity, Establishing a Common Ground for Sustainability, um, where she will be discussing the state of knowledge on the emerging field of soil biodiversity and implications for sustainability under current and future environmental change. 
So again, it's my pleasure to welcome you virtually to Purdue, and I hope we have a chance to see you here in person uh, in the near term. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, and thanks to all the sponsors. I just want to bring up my slides first, but I do want to say I'm really sorry I can't be there to meet everyone. I hope you all can see this okay. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides, the opening slide, because I just love the way it shows the tree and its roots in the soil. Anyway, I do like this first slide, but I've, now that you've heard a little bit about it and we're gonna be talking about soil, I'd, I'd like to go to the sustainable development goals. <clears throat> and I think this 2030 agenda for sustainable development really means thinking about goals that guide policy and action to improve life for everyone and everything around the world and respect that. But it is, it is a little bit more complicated than that. And what I want to try to convince you today is that soils and soil biodiversity really are important to achieving these sustainable development goals. Going back to this picture I like so much, I really think that soils and soil biodiversity <clears throat> sustain the biodiversity we see everywhere and even the biodiversity we can't see above ground. And I think that this, this is increasing in recognition. And so I'm going to kind of follow a pathway to try to show you how much soils are now being appreciated, but how much more work we need to do in terms of both science and in terms of achieving these global agendas. This is a very busy circle, but if you look in the center, soil is there. And what this is, is a, a number of multiple global agendas that we all are, are aware of. For example, climate change, the IPCC reports, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, scientists assessing the state of knowledge, or over here, biodiversity, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, Actually, both of these came uh, together at Rio, and I think it was 92. There are assessment reports from that, the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. The World Health Organization actually is concerned with soil because they have soil transmitted helmets, and they also have antibiotics they're interested in that may come from soils. Food security, of course, you know, how do we feed our future? water, desertification. These are multiple global agendas, but there's very few of them that actually mention the biodiversity of soil. The fact that these are kind of being seen at top levels as integrated and, and uh, connecting global agendas that, that they affect each other when we're thinking about them was shown recently, this was 2019, and I apologize for the business, busy part, but it's so interesting to me. This is about a congressional testimony about a global assessment report, particularly this one, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. This guy I've got the arrow pointing to is Sir Robert Watson, a physicist. He was one of the first chairs of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He was also chair of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, looking at ecosystem services and what nature provides us. He also has been a chair or co-chair of the Agricultural Assessment, Science and Technology for Development. But what he said at this meeting in 2019 was very interesting because he says we need all governments, governments to address the issues of human-induced climate change, loss of biodiversity, and land degradation. He is showing that these are all linked. And I think that is what the 17 Sustainable Development Goals also do. When we go in and we look at these, and these specific goals are a comprehensive agenda about building a sustainable planet for our futures and for the future communities of life on Earth. Each one is, for example, if you look at several of these, almost half of them actually have to do with soil, poverty, zero hunger, and they overlap, they bridge. For example, zero hunger, getting food, also has to do with gender equality. It has to do with how big our sustainable cities are. It has to do with number six, which is clean water. 
So all of these are a focus, but together, this multiple agenda comes together. And what I'd like to ask is, are we maximizing our potential to address all these challenges and the sustainable development goals if we don't have all the information, if we don't include all the information? So what I'll do is I'm going to kind of quickly <laughs> take you through about what has been happening with soil biodiversity science. What are the threats to soil biodiversity, the life in soil? What are the benefits we get from it? Can it be used for solutions in the future? I'll tell you a little bit about the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, kind of as a, as a encouragement to all that we can make a difference. And then integrating, I'll just finish with integrating these for sustainability. So first of all, just know that soils are really diverse habitats. I mean, we study the soil chemistry and physics and Hans Jenny, who was kind of the father of defining how so the five key factors that make up soil, he included invertebrates and microbes as key regulators of many functions that we didn't know about. But our knowledge has just accelerated on what we know about life in soil, what they do, where they are. We didn't have this information 20 years ago. We also know that compared, of course, to above ground species, and that's above the black line, that all the green parts that you see are species described. And when we look below ground, mostly invertebrates, there are very few uh, groups of taxa below ground that are adequately described so that we know who they are. So let's look at what's underground. What am I talking about when I'm talking about biodiversity? Well, first, look at the headline. We've got a much better estimate on how much diversity is below ground. And that alone, the fact that we've got almost a quarter of diversity of all biodiversity below ground, and we're not including it when we think about management or solutions or how it can help us is kind of excluding some real knowledge. And if we look at the scale from the top left-hand corner, the mycorrhizae, we're talking microns on some of these in the top row, nematodes, and then in the far right corner, you've got tardigrades, everybody's favorite. And then we come all the way down to the bottom right corner, and that's a European mole. It's a ground swirl, it may be using soil, maybe a prairie dog that's churning over nutrients in the soil. We've got a large range of scales of organisms, of taxa. And in fact, when you look at this chart, you may be a little blinded, but this is a list in Barget and Van der Putin's paper that it just gives you an idea that the numbers are astounding. If you held a handful of soil, you might have 5,000 different taxa in there. 5,000 in a handful of soil. Well, the Netherlands has, I think, 1,400 plant species, and I'm sorry if I missed that, but, you know, we've got a lot of diversity below ground, and the abundance is also huge. Anyway, we've got a large abundance and diversity, and it's what they do together that's really important. This is just a diagrammatic of a food web, but I just want you to kind of follow that there's a whole community of organisms, microorganisms, and all the way up to to uh, animals, invertebrates, that are feeding and helping plants grow, you know, returning nutrients to them. Then we also have the leaf and the wood falling on the soil, and it's transformed into nutrients, and it goes through a whole food channel, through bacteria, through micro, uh, fungi, and things eating on each other. It's your basic, simple food web with predators at the top. So this is, you know, the complexity below ground. And we've learned a lot about that, but we've also learned their threats. For example, if you look now, erosion desertification, we've got about 33% of the soils are degraded, according to the UN Convention on, to Combat Desertification. But it's, that's not all. We're now finding out about microplastics. We haven't included mining or pollution, just pollution in cities. Pollution in my yard, what do you pour into your yard? And I think it's becoming more recognized that there is a quiet extinction of invertebrates because we haven't paid enough attention to it. This is a really interesting paper by Nico Eisenhower and his group. 
where they say that soil invertebrates and soil dwelling larval stages of flying insects that may be pest above ground are neglected in many biodiversity databases, assessments. And of course, if the data isn't there and the information isn't there, they're also neglected when we need knowledge for conservation actions or policies or land management globally. Even the decline in abundance can decrease an ecosystem function. This particular graph shows on the left, left side in pink or orange, however you see this, a high level of beetles, the dung beetles. But when they are reduced, the proportion of dung that is removed from the field that goes back into the soil or through the beetle's body back into the soil is also reduced. So you've lost that transformation of nutrients. Here in this one, soil nematodes on the right, again shows that a reduction in the nematodes also affects carbon flux and carbon cycling. So just decreasing abundance is an impact. But probably the most uh, thorough paper to look at taxa across Europe from Sweden, further south, uh, involving a lot of taxa, involving a lot of work, showed that no matter what they did towards intensive agriculture, if you took a controlled and then more intensive agriculture, you saw a reduction in each group of taxa they were looking at and a corresponding increase, uh, decrease in ecosystem function. So what we mainly have here is just your basic soil food web on the left that's very highly constructed, has lots of species in it, being reduced with climate change, with agricultural intensification and other disturbances that people are looking at. So you have some either lost or impaired functioning. So I've kind of taken you through real quickly something that you probably assumed or already knew, but I think the important thing is what we have learned about multiple benefits that we get from soils and particularly soil, soil biodiversity. And for that, what I'm gonna do is show you a series of puzzle pieces almost that then have the scientific either evidence or a paper where you could go and find out more and see how that field has developed. So let's just take it that soil biodiversity on the bottom left, where we see the dark soil and the root going into the soil is kind of like the foundation for a number of other things that are going on. Not only food where it's just shown by the corn, um, human well-being, uh, wildlife above ground, plant productivity, um, carbon cycling, nutrient cycling, there's a number of different ecosystem functions that all tie back to soil. And so it naturally integrates some of these sustainable development goals. And that makes me think that it could be an integrator that, if we thought about that. This is one I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on just because I think it lays the basis for something we really didn't know and didn't have evidence for a few years ago. This paper by Cameron Wagg and his colleagues shows that as you go from right to left, let's see, that's backwards. If I go, if I go across uh, left to right and increase the number of species, we increase the number of functions, but it also correspondingly shows that if you do reduce species numbers, you reduce the numbers of functions that are being performed in the ecosystem or the numbers of the types of functions. So that's one, and it's a correlation. But Silveris et al, whoops, sorry. Silveris et al, in this colored one on the right, I think is pretty amazing because they, they really looked at about 4,600 above and below ground taxa. They looked at 14 ecosystem services. They looked at 100 data from 150 grasslands. And so all these are trophy groups here above and below ground, herbivores, primary producers, bacterial feeding, decomposers, and their food channel, plant symbionts like mycorrhizae and other uh, below ground predators. And what they found was it wasn't the number of species in the box. So if I only wanted to go in and look at above ground predators and the number of species there, and then relate it to how many functions they influenced, I might get a very different picture 
than if I look to cross trophy groups. The more trophy groups you have, the more functional groups, the more of these colored boxes that you have that perform different functions is much better for multifunctionality. So I think what this does is that, that when we see a fondly direct developed food web, it's not so much all the species that are in there, but what they're doing and how many functional groups we have really shows that it can have positive effects on ecosystem, ecosystem services and functions. And this has been followed up in a number of papers since then. Here's one about highly diverse forest and biodiversity. Here's an earlier paper by Francesca de Vries, again showing, number one, that we better be also educating uh, system, systematists, uh, microbiome, microinvertebrate biomes. Uh, identifying these organisms is turning out to be really beneficial for learning about ecosystem services. This one, it was a, an experiment that ran from Sweden across to Southern Europe. They all had the same experiment. They looked at intensive agriculture across it. They looked at a number. When you see the paper, it's very amazing to see soil carbon, mineralization. They go into all these different ecosystem functions, water transfer through the soil. And then they looked at the so contribution of soil organisms to these functions. And I found it astounding that they said at the end that the contribution was so important and so uh, notable in each of these ecosystem functions that we needed to, it was a call to think about mapping where they are and conserving some soil biodiversity depending on what we were looking at. So that was one, one kind of breakthrough that's happened in the last few years. Another is that soil, how, how does soil biodiversity support humanity? And I think the first one is, you know, that I've picked is, is not that all and we all know about it. But soil biota can increase agricultural sustainability depending on the crop by improving a number of different um, ecosystem functions. And then another one is just a review that uh, Ufa Nielsen and Johan Six and I did. And that one again has just been a field that is now expanding, not because necessarily this paper, because of the realization, if you go back to that, that uh, kind of circle I had with soil in the center, and the fact that soil biodiversity is so important, as I mentioned, soil transmitted helminths. There's also uh, just soil minerals that can be toxic in high amounts, but it's the combination of the organisms and what we get in terms of antibiotics or new thinking about medicines and indigenous medicines also in indigenous foods and how can it help and make it more nutritious. Here also is life above ground. And this one is really important because there's a, and I haven't been able to find the reference that 90% of most organisms, most animals above ground have some aspect of life in the soil. And so, you know, we see this, but we don't put it in our head how much various above ground animals are dependent on life in the soil for food and subsistence or what type of life. Here is one that struck me because it isn't just any old ant that a Bob White can eat. They can eat fire ants, but it reduces their survival and weight gain. So these interactions between life are strong, connected, and we need to pay attention. Now, here's one that is often talked about and there's some syntheses out since these papers were written um, about whether earthworms are positive or negative and in what fields and whether or not they really alleviate uh, the, you know, the uh, porosity, they, they relieve the flooding, the water passing through. And so there's a number of papers that are out and we're trying to come up with what is the region? Where, where, where do we see this? And there actually have been some papers about the distribution of earthworms. There was one in science by Helen Phillips and a lot of people. But perhaps the field that has really uh, taken off in the last 10 to 15 years has been, how is 
carbon stabilized in soils. And what does soil biodiversity have to do with that? Because it's been, it's been hard to look at that, but now we can look at necromass, we can look at the contribution of mycorrhizae, of the microbial pool, um, even earthworms and other fauna to stabilization of carbon in soil. And of course, this has to do with regulating the carbon and keeping it in the soil for a long time. And to give you an idea of this, here is a, a question that a number of us came up with and said, we're going to see what kind of data we can get. And, you know, does it matter? Basically is the question, so what that there's a huge abundance of nematodes in soils? What are the functional groups and where are they located globally was part of the paper. But when we put it on a, you know, the actual numbers and estimated what nematode biomass is equal to, it's equal to 82% of total human biomass. So that's a lot of nematodes to a lot of depth in different ecosystems. And then what is the carbon respired to? You know, what is it equivalent to? It was quite a surprising uh, paper and that's worth reading because it's only one taxa. We also have a lot of other tax in the soil that are stabilizing carbon, moving carbon around, putting it in aggregates, but we also have respiration as well as storage of carbon. So it's a turnover. So the question comes up, can we actually use some of this knowledge that we're gaining right now in solutions for the future? What does it really contribute? It's one thing to say, there are species there, we're losing species. Uh, yes, they integrate you know, the solutions for sustainability, but what is it like on the real world when we're thinking about it? And I think people have been thinking about this for years. Aldo Leopold has before that. Conservation farming practices. Now there's a bigger push on urban ecosystem management and how does that work? Protecting natural areas, not only for above and below ground, but then ecosystem restoration. And we know that no-till and low-till can sustain crop production, reduce the need for inputs. That also has an impact on soil biodiversity, but the surrounding aquatic biodiversity. So again, it's kind of a, of a central agenda of thinking about soils and keeping the life in the soils. Um, ecosystem restoration. Here's some data that says, yes, we can by restoring soil biodiversity over time, we have more connected networks. So if you look at these, these words outside on the circle, this is again, an example of taxonomy, being able to look at basidiomites and mycorrhizal fungi and uh, saprotrophic fungi and orobatid mites and nematodes at the top going all the way around to many, many different types of bacteria that were looked at in the microbiome type thing. But what we're looking at is the connections across that circle, the little light green lines. And if it was recently plowed, and then you wait 10 years, you're starting to build, and this is putting it just in restoration, uh, and then long-term, it takes a long time to just let abandoned land go back to establishing these connections establishing the trophy groups, but it has shown that you see it more connected. Now, we, we know also that these many functions that they are looking at in this Ellie Morin's paper here, that if we look even further globally, we see that there are global mismatches in above and below ground biodiversity. And here I will just tell you that if you can see the turquoise, the turquoise is where there's high soil biodiversity and the yellow is where there's high above ground biodiversity. So for example, in South America, you can see part of the Amazon is high yellow, high above ground biodiversity. Why is this important? This is important because our management is all based on what we see above ground. Now I'm making a general statement, but primarily it's all based on what is above ground biodiversity without saying is the biodiversity below ground also high in the Amazon? Is it also high in where we're trying to conserve 
parks because the diversity is so high in the middle of a city, for example. So I think data such as where are they? What is their biogeographic location? Because all species are not everywhere, but these functional groups with different species may be. Knowing this kind of data is a solution for different regions. It's a good way to think about their parks, how they're spending money, getting the, all the stakeholders in a room to say, how much do we want to preserve this particular area if it's not doing all the things that we want, cleansing water and adding all the other benefits. One of the things that also is much more uh, in display, I think, than it has been before, has been monitoring. Monitoring primarily has been for soils, soil chemistry, how is carbon turning over? And you can see this is an example of Lucas, the Land Use and Cover Area Soil Survey. They sampled every three years, but in 2018, they started sampling for um, microbial sam uh, samplings they're running microbial sampling. This database is open. You can write Alberta or Ghazi. And they've also just expanded it in terms of soil biodiversity. As part of that, a number of volunteers started as a soil bond, a soil biodiversity observation network. Our Carlos Guerra leads this whole thing. Uh, I'm, I'm a co-chair, but the idea is to understand soil biodiversity, even in these areas where we don't have much data, say in the middle of, I don't know, in the middle of Canada, uh, but also to involve people who live there to take the samples for us, send the samples so that we can extract them and have standard methods from around the world to look at how soil biodiversity is changing over time, compare it to a managed system or a park that's been a conservation area and to gather data. And we have over a thousand locations right now and we're gonna start working on that. And you can contact Carlos Guerra. We'd love to have a North American one, but an even more is the effect on policy. This is a paper that was a science policy paper that came out in January. And I think the important thing about that, that I want to kind of uh, remind everybody out is that if we don't say what we're learning in science and volunteer to be a scientist working on a report or in coming up with, here is some data that was missing that might be, help fill out a niche for policy then we will not ever see soil biodiversity as a solution or an integrator or as even part of a science policy. This is also interesting because of the, the paper is interesting to me because we have an assessment that's not, it's, uh, it's online, it's extra information about policies that either do or do not worldwide, that do or do not mention soil biodiversity as a reason to conserve land. So what I've been doing is showing you about soil biodiversity being this kind of cornerstone, an integrator for many benefits. Not only does the life and soil provide many benefits, but their habitats that they work with change daily, provide many benefits. And I think I've showed you some early data. I mean, some of it's uh, before then, but it takes a while for people to read data and get it to the, get it to the market, so to speak. And I want to just say that I think soil biodiversity is important to all ecosystems. I think we found that out. We just may not have as many data, much data from some as others. So one of the things that I'm, I kind of want to bring this in in terms of uh, people stepping up and taking a leadership role, and that's to talk about the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. This is one that, that I would say to my colleagues. Um, many of us have had great ideas at scientific meetings and sitting around thinking about, well, you know, I don't know why they don't do something. And this is one that took off, which was quite a surprise to us. There were about five people involved in saying, well, we think there's accelerating knowledge in soil biodiversity. What should we do about it? And what we actually did was come up with a name, the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, for the few of us that were there, and say, 
let's get a bunch of scientists together. It's a scientific agenda. And then let's try to get it to be a place where people come and say, hey, have you got experts on antibiotics and cows? You know, and what do they do to soils? Well, of course, now we've got, you know, lots of people. But that's the kind of idea behind this is to how to have different means of getting information out. Uh, the Global Soil Biodiversity, if, if you haven't joined, join. It's free. I mean, it's just information and exchange of information. And um, go on the website and look. But I want to tell you some of what it has done. And it's grown, I should say, to over 4,000. In fact, we don't count anymore. 4,000 members. We now get called by policy agendas, everything from the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, to the Global Soil Partnership to the European Commission to get our global network of people that might be able to provide evidence for policies that they're writing a report on. And so that way we've become, become kind of a central, a central node of a network um, the other thing we do is share our information through something like the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. This is available as a print book, direct PDF download. It's 176 pages. Or through our website, where it has been broken down into chapters, as you see, small pictures over here. I have, I get a great de degree of glee seeing somebody tweet that they have had their kids during COVID going through the atlas pictures on the website and learning all about the animals and life below ground. But the most recent thing we've done is the first ever assessment of the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity. This was through more than 300 scientists globally who contributed words, chapters, diagrams to this. It was called for by the Convention on Biological Diversity for all lands, not just agriculture. Previously, say 30 years ago, it would have been only for agriculture. I would want to point to all the sponsors. GSBI is down here, the European Commission, uh, the Global Soil Partnership, ITPS. Um, there are a number of them. And FAO, of course, was the coordinator for the CBD to do this. So I think you know there will need to be another assessment. Where are we? What do we know? How many trophy groups would it take, for example, in a particular region to build up soil biodiversity? How do, how do we mesh soil health, which has many definitions in many countries, into thinking about it as soil health with indicators that might be standardized or might be more useful to policymakers? I'd also mention that we have a symposium coming up. Uh, this again, we partnered with FAO and that will be coming up. It's free, it's virtual. Uh, a number of speakers, a number of papers and abstracts are being presented over these days. And if you can't make that, one of the other things we do is to do webinars. And we were just talking beforehand on how wonderful virtual webinars are because we reach a larger audience and we get questions back that we haven't thought about of things to do. And so this was one we had last month uh, on climate resili on resilience to uh, climate extremes. And this one is on soil carbon and the role of soil biodiversity in soil carbon. And that'll be on this same page. So what we try to do is share knowledge that's evidence-based to get it into policy. One of the big issues, which I don't think we have, assigned, we have uh, figured out yet, is how do we take all the wonderful work that's been done by what I call the natural historians of soil biodiversity, the people who knew about the microbes that you plated out on various, various augers and what that told you compared to the person who knows the orobatid mites better than anybody in the world and can identify it at 20 feet. How do we compare that to this wonderful acceleration of tools that we've gotten to link those together for both knowledge of what do they do in soil to molecular uh, microbiome level connections. These are coming together, but the data is enormous. If we think about the human genome, this is a desperate need for understanding what is going on below our soils. 
And then I just like to think a little bit about this integration of global agendas for sustainability. We could also say that we could put water at the center of this circle. And we could say that that is really important. But I think that when we think about soil and terrestrial systems, the, ver the variety of soils that we see in natural systems, the diversity of life that we see, and then we think about all the agendas we're facing, everything from climate change, air pollution, transportation, where are we putting our cities? How are we going to keep covering up fertile land? What are we doing about microplastics? We do come back to what passes through the soil. What is there transforming the soil? What does it provide for us? And so I think when we, I hope I've covered that soil provides for us many more things than we think about. And if you look at this list, there is some evidence behind it. There may be some evidence against it, which we also need to know and assess. And there are experts in this world who are particularly early career scientists who think working cross-discipline, working as teams, integrating these various issues that are global environmental challenges, or integrating this, some of the 17 sustainable development goals, I think this is really a scientific frontier that is going to fast track. And I think it also has to be done in food with what are the plants, what are the genes, what are we looking below ground. So some of this is going on, but we've got to connect who's doing what also. So networks are really important to overlap, kind of the network of network um, thought we have here. So I kind of want to get close to closing here by saying that we face many grand challenges for the future of our planet. I think we all recognize the urgency for the life that lives on it, including ourselves. This is a UN table, the IP of the best um, intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem, but it's a huge room that's going to take a very large table, each bringing their own local expertise for their region uh, and their passion to want to address these challenges. GSBI is a focus for us as soil biodiversity. We're very, still very excited about it and what we're learning and what we're seeing. Does it work in LA as well as it works in the Amazon? No, we don't know. Let's put that together. But I think engaging scientists working with scientists, policymakers through these interactions, we help get the information of the importance of soil biodiversity in lands and to us in all biodiversity on the center stage. So I think that's really the crux of what we're doing is acceleration of knowledge, we need to share it. And so I would say that Global soil biodiversity science contributes to a, to a sustainable future and that we have a chance to continue to accelerate our knowledge and share that knowledge so that we can have a sustainable future. And with that, I'd just like to thank a lot of people, the GSBI Scientific Advisory Committee, who always give me support, Dr. Monica Farfan, who's here, Executive Director of the GSBI Secretary at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability that houses us for so long, and all the many scientists and practitioners worldwide who write us and contribute information towards advancing science of soil biodiversity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Diana. That was amazing. Um, really appreciate um, your giving us that instruction on biodiversity and the implications and the effort that's been really astounding for what you've created uh, with your initiative. So I just want to remind everyone that we'll be taking questions in the chat room and we'll be reading them off. 
Uh, maybe we can start off with the, with the question, Diana. You, you mentioned a term um, uh, toward the end of your talk of uh, soil health. Mm -hmm. And um, you were talking uh, throughout the talk about multifunctionality and um, how soil provides benefit to humanity, humanity. But with most of the land under management and that management really focused on very few functions, which are the provisional functions of basically, let's say, bushels per acre. How have you tried to then communicate with practitioners um, that benefit of multifunctionality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's not only me that communicates. I should keep emphasizing that, you know, it's colleagues in, in Brazil and um, around the world who have seen some of this and are saying, okay how can we do this can we add one or more you know what what are the trade-offs it's always a balance of trade-offs economics food you know whatever the crop is that's going to bring in the the the, uh, the benefit uh, the, the economic benefit so you can live but also i think that people are interested in soil health in many countries i mean that's very apparent uh they're interested and i think from the un level they're pushing sustainable soil management and that is including soil biodiversity. They may not say it is for multifunctions. You know, that may not be the agenda. But certainly, I think that a message is getting across. Um, I was surprised it came up on World Soil Day uh, in December. And I, I can't say that one particular function would be more interesting to a particular grower than another. But I think that with soil health, it is broadening to not only agriculture per se, crops per se, but to management of forest, management uh, even of deserts. I've heard that. What you know? What are we going to do to improve, to stop erosion, to, to uh, improve? Can we drop some earthworm out there? Which don't do that. But the discussion is going. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm optimistic, but I'm not so optimistic that I expect that people will do this just because they're getting multifunctions in every place. I think it's good knowledge to have as an argument of why to move forward with something like that. Um, so you are the leading proponents of trying to fill these blind spots that we have in biodiversity and function across the planet mm -hmm. um, to provide some information that the Nielsen paper you showed. And so what can be done, though, not just for um, places that already have a high degree of diversity uh, maps, but also have a high number of scientists who are doing that? How do we then build capacity in those places in the world that require scientists who are doing macroinvertebrate microbiology type of work? What can we do to help with that from, let's say, your institutes or other institutes around the country? to build that capacity around the world? Well, I, I think one thing that we're finding out, for example, there were about eight of us who thought about the Soil Observation Biodiversity Network. And we just said, oh my gosh, getting it done through agencies might be a little hard because you know somebody controls this or is interested in ag, somebody else might be con in Europe might be, it might be another agency. We'd have to go through all this. Instead, we just said, how many people wanted to uh, contribute their expertise to train other people so that we can look in a number of countries at a particular animal or functional group. And particularly with, I think it, I was really surprised with um, FAO has these labs that are run analyses around the world, places that I we would never you know, I'm, I'm sure I would never be able to talk to people. And so they started being interested in what aspects of soil biodiversity could be also measured in these labs if they had the equipment. How could they learn to identify? And I must say that we build on projects that have already been tried and tested. The, the Tropical Soil Biology and Fertility Program, if you're aware of that, that was, I mean, it's finished now, but it was across, I think, I don't know, seven nations in the tropics uh, from the Philippines to 
you know, Africa to uh, South America. And part of it was having workshops that trained people on how to identify or how to put out litter bags, you know, various aspects. And I think that there is interest in having workshops that people could come to for a week to learn, learn a particular organism or to learn a molecular tool where you would be able to hunt for a specific pest or whatever. And I think these are growing. Uh, the fact that the FAO was interested in putting some aspect of soil biodiversity as a great requirement for all these labs to start to measure, to see change, was very interesting. Thank you. So a question from the, the uh, audience. So, so you mentioned the importance of needing to develop networks of networks to satisfy these needs and, and capacities. And so we have a question about collaborations between specifically the global uh, forest biodiversity initiatives and what you discussed. And uh, is that something that is already underway or is this something that uh, is a new idea? Let me, let me make sure. Um... So, in other words, is GSBI coordinating with other biodiversity aspects? Yes. Um, well, I, I have to say in terms of um, just to how much we can do here, there's two of us. And so we have to get the word out to other people to do. But yes, uh, for example, the um, uh, global uh, biodiversity, is it GBF, the Global Biodiversity Facility? is very aware of, say, the mismatch of data. They're very interested in this and that we've got old data and new data. Um, we are getting copied. There's a new framework convention for climate change that's coming up. And we are being alerted on all the different NGOs and the various different uh, people. And what we're trying to come out with a collective voice. You know, if, I'm not going to uh, stand back and, and say, oh, it's got to be soil zuberalis when we've got so many urgent problems to look at globally. And so the connections I, I see are much better. People are reaching out to us as much as we're reaching out to them. It's just how much we can do. We're not gonna be at the global, you know, the Convention for Biological Diversity and their decisions on frame, framing it, but they are aware of us and we communicate. Thank you. There's another question. Uh so it gets to, I think you, you showed at the end, a couple of science policy papers that you thought were particularly impactful. The, uh, one of the audiences, Jeff Dukes mentions, uh, are there any individual scientific papers on the soil biodiversity that you think have penetrated into the political sphere and had important impact there? Yeah, I, th I think certainly. And, and I, I also say, I don't know how long it takes to have an impact. So these are, this may be my bias, that I, I think some of the papers that Patrick Lavelle and George Brown have done in Brazil on macrofauna uh, have people looking as, as a matter of um, using them as indicators, for example, of how disturbed the soils are and whether they've lost earthworm species. I think in terms of, and that, and that ties in with function also in different areas of Brazil and different landscapes. I think I would have to think about, um, you know, the carbon sequestration. I think there's an interesting paper out now, whether it will have an impact. It's um, uh, Jocelyn Lavalle and Francesca Cotrufo. So, you know, I, I've got some ideas, but to think right off the bat, which are the most important? I think it's bringing scientists together and having a couple of clear opinion pieces citing that in other journals so that we make our colleagues aware first that it's not a dead science. It's not just the way it was 25 years ago. It's an emerging science. And I think that's true for any changing paradigm, any new tools we get, whether we're using stable isotopes or you know, satellites, we have to tie it together to what will it answer now. I don't know if that's a good answer. I didn't give you, I didn't give Jeff a good answer, perhaps. Um, so along those same lines, um, one of the uh, participants writes that politicians clearly are probably overwhelmed 
um, with the amount of information that's coming to them. And though if it's a goal is to put soil at the center stage, uh, what is a companion effort out there to integrate concepts of soil health agenda uh, with those other causes about biodiversity, climate, oceans um, that aren't competing, but instead work together. Uh, again, with the final sentence, if I were a political leader, I'd feel overwhelmed. Yeah, that's that's one of the nice things about about this. There's a lot to do. I, I think one of the things that we do is to work with people who are in science policy. I'm not trained in science policy, but I certainly now know who to call up and say, um, this would be really great to get you know, some people to comment on before we publish it. For example, I mentioned the, the paper that was in the science opinion piece. If you look at that, it's got the chief scientists of the European Union. It's got, we had them and, and the chief scientist for FAO, Ronald Vargas. We had them look at it and review it and critique it. And their comments were so helpful that they became authors on it. And so I think we don't want to overwhelm anybody. We do have to reduce it. And so I'd be interested to have this person look at the summary for political, for policymakers of this last report, the status and state of knowledge of soil biodiversity that came out FAO uh, in 2020. It's downloadable off the web and you just get the short version, this, the summary, and see if we got a message across there that isn't so overwhelming. And to link it to soil health, we have people, we, we don't say, oh, no soil health people allowed. That's, that's crazy because there's so much going on that we can learn and vice versa. We, we may have different uh, agendas. We may be thinking soil overall. Soil health is a very important cornerstone of that. So how can we exchange information? I, I don't see that. I've gone to countries where, there, where I've been asked to talk about indicators of soil health. Uh, and so that's really ed educated me. Yeah. Well, I think we are actually at our time. And so, Diane, um, on behalf of uh, everyone here, I want to thank you deeply for sharing this with us all. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to present you with something very appropriate. It's a, a crystal globe oh, that wow. really, I think, demonstrates the global reach that you've had uh, to the highlighting the importance of soil biodiversity. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you to you. Um, to hear us show it up again. Uh, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. We'll be sending that to you, or maybe I'll be driving it out to you. I'm not sure. Oh, that would be great. Go see some family camping. But again, um, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. And um, uh, all of you, uh, thank you for your questions as well. Yes. And I'm sure if there are follow up questions, we can uh, pass them along uh, to Dr. Wall. I saw that there were many, and uh, some very interesting ones related to actually uh, Indigenous knowledge and in biodiversity. Yes. I think it'd yes. be a good follow-up and so that's also that. well covered in the i think it's well covered in that uh new assessment ah uh, excellent so thank you so much um all right thank you thank you for inviting me i enjoyed it so much take care bye-bye